<laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, well, first of all, thanks very much for having me today. Uh, my name is Gonzalo Casas. I am a software engineer in in the Gamacho Color Research Team in, in the ETH story. So, and today I want to show a little bit what, what we are doing with um, fabrication, robotic fabrication in particular, and open source tools. Okay, so as I was saying, I'm from Gamacho Color Research at ETH. Um, our, our lab has over a decade of experience in robotic fabrication and an intensive track record in of working with different robotic systems, technologies, uh, materials, and so on, from everything from uh, small scale models to full scale architectural projects. And uh, throughout our research, the, we, we ultimately aim at somehow redefining the role of architects in the, in the future. And most of our work involves industrial robots. Uh, they allow us to basically precisely control placement and orientation in, of objects in space, which drastically opens up the, the design freedom of the architect because it allows to build non-standard uh, elements and structures at no additional cost. So in, in short, what we do, our workflow is, um, we start by designing parametrically, we then embed semantics into these design models and we finally bridge these models uh, directly to the machines that will fabricate them. Right. So that that workshop that uh, sorry that workflow crosses a number of different fields, and each of those uses a um, completely different set of tools, software, and so on. Uh, so one of the key aspects for us has always been interdisciplinarity. We we need to be able to work together as architects and structural engineers and material scientists and roboticists and whatnot. And we need to somehow share the same language and not the same programming language, no? but same rather the same human language. We need to share, we need shared understanding. So in that context, um, what we're doing is we're building a framework um, called Compass and in particular, our team builds an extension for that framework called Compass Fab. Uh, Compass is a larger initiative which aims at uh, enhancing collaboration and research in the, in the AEC industry. It's, it's an open source Python framework. Um, it, it's developed here in Switzerland at ETH under a program called NCCR Digital Fabrication. And it has two driving goals. One of them is, as I mentioned, collaboration in interdisciplinary teams. And the other one is transferability, both across teams, different teams, and to industry as well. So um, based on that, the framework is, is open source with a very permissive MIT license. And it's also CAD agnostic. It means you can use it with whatever tool uh, for, for CAD you want. So, Taking that perspective, Compass can be seen as a sort of ecosystem. Uh, it's composed by a main or a core library and a number of additional packages around it, which um, bridge, to bring up again the same word, uh, bridge libraries and tools and different technologies from different fields, and basically integrating them. The, the core library of Compass has, is cross-platform. Again, it's, it's written in pure Python. By pure Python, what I mean is uh, this runs in Iron Python inside Rhino, basically. Um, this is usually done with fallbacks. So we, when we're outside Rhino, we, 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 do, we use uh, C extensions and as, as much as speed optimizations as we, as we can get. But everything runs also in pure Python. And it's, it's very liberally licensed under an MIT open source license, which means that you can have commercial projects based on it. So the, the core library provides three basic things, to put it somehow. Uh, one is geometry primitives, of course, then uh, data structures, uh, that means um, so graph data structures, meshes, and 
and volumetric dimensions and, and, and what, whatnot. And then it also provides basic robots support. But uh, what is really composing concretely? In, at its most basic level, it's just a standalone library. You can, you can start Python interpreter and start doing geometry processing on the command line if you feel like. Of course, that's, that's not the way that we normally use it. Um, it has some built-in standalone viewers like this one, but the normal way to use it is integrated in CAD. So uh, either in, in Rhino for Mac or for Windows, uh, or also for Blender. And the topic I mentioned before about CAD uh, agnostic is that usually code um, written for one looks almost identical when you swap the CAD. So this is a very simple example of displaying a mesh and that is loaded from, from the internet. And you see that the code on the, um, on the left is for Rhino, the code on the right is the same code for Blender. The, the code is identical, the only difference is that we import this artist component that is taking care of, uh, of the displaying of the mesh and we import it from a different package and that's it, the, the rest of the code is identical. Now, um, next to the core library, there are a number of different uh, packages, as I mentioned before, and tools uh, for integration into different domains, different um, disciplines and fields. There's things like Rhino Vault 2, which is based on, on Compass or interlocking components, uh, slicers for 3D printing, for 3D printing. But today I want to focus on the first one in this list, um, which is Compass Fab for robotic fabrication. And I'll touch upon the next one as well at the end. Um, but I'll start from the end. I'll show first how it all works together uh, and then go into some details. What, what we see here is almost all the components in action. This is Rhino showing an animated robot model. The model was loaded from ROS, which is a uh, robotics tool that I'll go into in a few minutes. And the animation is not, not just uh, pretty, it's, um, it's been path planned, so there's motion planning involved, two types of, of planning, one is Cartesian, the other one is free space. Um, there's a planning scene management going on to, to do collision checking, basically all the operations and everything, uh, all these calculations are happening in the motion planning framework of ROS, which is called MOVIT. So the, the goal of the Compass Fab library is to simplify, to, to quote the previous presentation, to lower the barrier of entry into uh, robotics. So simplify planning and execution of robotic fa fabrication processes. So in that, for that purpose, Compass Fab is also open source. It's also Python package. It's also uh, CAD independent. It's built on Compass. And what it does is it breaches or provides interfaces to existing state-of-the-art software libraries and tools. Uh, many of them available in the field of robotics. Many of them are usually not accessible from within the parametric design environment. So that's what we do. We try to make them easy to use um, from an environment that we are comfortable working with. And I want to touch on two areas of, the, of this framework today. One is um, robot models and the other one is robotic backends. So robot models, um, to, this basically answers the question of, of how do we represent a robot in memory so that we can operate it, with it. Uh, we, we try not to reinvent any wheels here. So we base on things that are standard or de facto standard and fundamentally open standards. Again, as it, as it was mentioned in the previous talk. So the, um, the base for the robot model representation is a format called URDF, which comes from the ROS community, the open source community of ROS. Uh, it's widely spread in the, um, in the robot, robotics research field, um, yeah, disciplines. 
And the one of the big benefits of this is that uh, being open source and being widely used means that there's a large repository of existing robot models available for us so that we we yeah, there's there's a lot of support that already exists. Uh, so your URDF represents a robot as a tree structure. It's an, a tree that connects um, links that are the rigid mechanical elements, and they're connected by joints, and they hold all the associated geometrical and semantic information of its parts. Now, uh, this is, I have a few of these boring slides of code. <laughs> Uh, this is how to load a, a robot model. This, this example is complete, so it shows again how to load it in Rhino, how to load it in Blender. The code is identical. This goes to GitHub to a specific repository that we configured here, and it just gets the entire model from there. And as, as with the mesh example before, the only difference between using this in Blender or in Rhino is that we import the RTS component from a different location. And the output is what we would expect the robot shows in either of the tools. Now, um, the other area that is very important is how we actually do things with it. Um, these are the backends. Again, we're not reinventing any wheels. So all the heavy lifting for things like simulation, planning, and in, in, um, inter-process communication and messaging, all these things. We use state-of-the-art tools, standard tools that exist. So we we have different backends that we connect to. Um, currently, there are three of them supported. The first one that we integrated was BREP, which is a nice simulation tool. It's a, it's a regular application. It's relatively simple to use. Then we focus our efforts in integrating ROS which is uh, a very, very sophisticated tool, very large. And in particular, we have deep integration into Movit motion planning framework that runs in Cycles. And just recently, uh, it's in the main branch. It's not yet released, but it will be very soon. We added support for PyBullet physics library. I want to stop a little bit into what is ROS and how we integrate with it and what we can do with it. Um, ROS is an incredibly powerful tool. Uh, it's, it's called robotic operating system, but it's not really an operating system. It's also not entirely only for robotics, but um, it, it's very, very advanced and it's very widely supported, but it's also very complex. The learning curve is very steep and it's really not easy to, to run within the environments that we're used to. So we try to abstract away as much complexity as we can from it. ROS, um, if you want to kind of picture how ROS gets into the picture is, ROS runs and, and allows interconnection between multiple nodes or agents so that you can um, design a fabrication process or any kind of process as a number of different nodes that interconnect. So a typical deployment would be like this one on the, on the, uh, on the screen that has a number of different um, nodes doing different activities and all talking to each other. Now, how do we get ROS? Um, ROS is a Linux tool. There's no Windows support, or there is a little bit of Windows support, but it's extremely limited. Uh, it's very tricky to get to work, uh, to say the very least. So what we do is we rely on Docker to distribute this. This backend and actually every backend that we use. Um, Docker, if you're not familiar with it, it's um, um, very popular in, in DevOps and software engineering. You can think of Docker as super lightweight virtual machines. Um, we use it to package reproducible entire systems. So what we do is we, we basically uh, go down from a very elaborate um, set up process in the terminal that runs on your Linux to one command on your terminal that will take care of everything. Or um, if you're on VS Code, right click and select a menu option. Um, what we end up, so an overview of all the moving parts in a, in a, in a setup 
usual for, for someone in our team would be something like this. So we see on the top, we have a robot controller. At the bottom, we have the laptop of a user. Uh, Rhino is running as a, as a user interface. Rhino will use, or the user, the architect or designer and in the computer will use Compass Fab to talk to the robot. Um, Compass Fab uses another open source library that we released a few years ago called Roslipi, um, connecting via WebSockets to the middle layer, which is running all in, in, in Docker. So this is this is basically a black box to the user. Um, and from then on, we can connect to a robot driver, for instance, and then the robot driver will talk TCP sockets to the robot controller. Um, and that's, that's the uh, general system setup. And there are a few features that I want to highlight today that you can do rather easily with Compass file that would otherwise be pretty complicated. There are three in the robot planning part. Um, one is kinematics. So how do you do, how do you resolve forward kinematic function, which means if you, um, how do you get the position of the end effector of the robot based on the current configuration of the robot? The inverse kinematics function would be the opposite. How, how do you get the, pot the potential configurations of a robot that uh, if you want to reach a certain point in space? Then another large topic is motion planning. How do you how do you manage to go from A to B and under which conditions or um, constraints you do that? And then planning scene operations. How do you manage, how do you make sure that collision checking and all that works? Now, the first few slides are intentionally very boring um, because they show how easy it is to calculate these things. The, this example, for example, is how to calculate forward kinematics. Um, and you'll see that we load a robot, we define a configuration with radians for each of its um, joints. And then we say, robot, give me the forward kinematics of that configuration. And that's it, we get a frame over or a plane in 3D with orientation. The next one would be similar, simple, inverse kinematics, uh, almost the same. We start from a start configuration and we say, I want to get to this frame. Um, give me a configuration that works. That's all. Something very important to note here is that these examples are full examples. You can copy paste this in your Python editor and they will actually re give you a result. So um, um, it's not a fake, you know, only for slides uh, example. These are complete examples. But planning has two, two options. Either you do Cartesian motion planning which means you're moving, you're moving in linear space. Um, so you're moving linearly. There's a few more options, but you pass a list of frames that you want to pass through, and then you get a trajectory. And um, kinematic or free space motion, and you get, you want to, to go from A to B, you don't care how, uh, so you let the robot choose the path that it thinks is best. And you again get a trajectory. And now to almost finish, um, so you have the, all that planning sorted out. You got trajectories, you got configurations, you got uh, everything that you need to operate the robot. How do you control the robots? There are three sort of basic ways in which we see you can control a robot. One is offline control. This would be the traditional uh, mode. You write um, vendor specific, ugly, old uh, robot code and you upload it to the robot controller and that's it. It runs. Um, then you have the online real-time control, real-time in the sense of software uh, software guarantees of time of, of execution. This is usually the domain of roboticist and robotics research. That's not what we do. And the, the last point is what we focus on, which is online, because we want to have a sort of conversation with the robot. We want to be able to, to, to be connected to the robot and, and continuously update what's happening. Uh, but it's non real time in the sense that we don't have hard guarantees on the execution times. Um, but it basically allows, it's fast enough that you perceive it as a human, as real time. 
Uh, all right, so that's basically it. I want to finish with like, how do you get started if you want to use these tools. We put a lot of effort into making these tools easy to use. So uh, if you are into Python, you'd recognize this line as the, the one of the especially special in scientific um, um, communities. Uh, Compass is a, is a framework, it's a library that is available in Conda. So you say Conda install Compass Lab and you're good to go. For more information, go to the website. We try to document as much as possible. A lot of examples are online, a lot of workshops are online. So yep, I would say just try it out if you can. And that would be it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gonzalo, for the beautiful and clean presentation. Um, just a quick note, if you do have any questions from the audience, please drop them in the Q&A uh, box in the, in the bottom of the screen, and I'll pick them up as we go along. Yeah, thank you very much. It, it looks pretty sweet and, and simple, actually. Uh, pretty easy to use, no? Um, who, who would be the end user actually? What, what, what's your idea about that? Like who, who would actually be employed, deploying and, and using this, these tools? Um, and our team is mostly architects and those are our intended users. Um, so we, when, when I started saying we're trying to redefine the role of the architect, it is, it is architects, but they are like, I don't know if to put it somehow, digitally native architects you know so we're being a university we're also training a new cohorts of, uh, of architects that think this way and teaching them these sort of tools from the onset so right and is it is it then being used outside so i, I understand it's really in your group at the moment let's say right do you see future uses outside of this as well then let's say or um we we try to promote it to be used outside there's nothing uh, stopping it so the the tool is open source since two years already i think um we presented it first time in robark 2018. um we see for example we see the adoption of the underlying tools are picking up Roslib by this library that that we released before Compass Fab that does the communication to Rust. This is already used a lot uh, in communities that have actually no connection to architecture sometimes. Um, and Compass Fab, we try to promote it in different, different uh, settings. The, it's used in a lot of locations because um, basically all the PhDs that are finishing in our chair and they're leaving, they usually take it with them wherever they go. So they, 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 they keep using the tools uh, outside. But of course, it's a relatively new framework. So um, it would be nice yeah, if more people would use it. Yeah. Of course. And I guess actually that ties in quite nicely with, with the first question as well. Like robotic fabrication in itself is, of course, still quite novel in, in construction, let's say, right? Uh, widely used in the car industry, but not necessarily in uh, on the building side, let's say. Um, have you seen any good adoption of fabrication and maybe this, this framework, let's say, on, on a larger scale construction? And as well, how do you see it then? Is, is the architect actually going to deliver the G-code as a deliverable as part of the, the construction information or, or how would that work? Um... For large projects, and, and I mean, we obviously did some of them ourselves, right? So there's a there's a house um, built here in Switzerland that was built uh, by a number of different research teams in in our um, institute that uses all these tools. Um, externally, there are some some projects that are starting, but this is all relatively new, like. Completely outside the, 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 so on industry, it's not so common yet. Uh, what was the question, sorry? 
Yeah, and then actually, exactly, if, if it's been used yet already. And um, do you see actually this becoming like the G-code coming out of the package? Would this be a deliverable towards construction documents, towards actually the fabricators on site? Um, that's an interesting question because we don't really deliver G-code. And right. maybe that's the, that, that is part of the philosophy. It, um, I think the, the role of the architect is somehow fusing from, from being on one side of the, of the drawing table, let's say, and then shipping floor plans to the other side for it to be constructed. The, the role of the, of the architect is merging with the fabrication one. So it's no longer, um, it's not longer that the architect will deliver the just the execution code, either G code or whatever that might be. Um, but the architect will be a, a, an integral part of the fabrication process because uh, he or she can have a saying on things like this is this is a regular topic that comes up in our in research in, in our research team is um if you can actually leverage the fact that you can keep regenerating the model all the time because it's parametric and there's no there's no cost in regenerating if you are uh, at the construction site let's say can you some for example uh, retro retrofit the model with knowledge that you get directly from construction from, fabric, from fabrication so yeah um we'll see how the how the whole thing evolves but uh, definitely i see a need of a redefined re, re, redefinition of the of the role great great and then we have another one uh from theodore galanos actually um a comment slash compliment as well as a question so he says he loves compass and uh, the wonderful geometrical functions along with the clear code and also thanks for sharing it openly so he's wondering um since you build this quite so software agnostic, um, are you planning to actually translate into a, a bit faster code, let's say, for instance, Julia or, or anything else? Um, this is a, a recurring topic also. <laughs> uh, especially we have some collaborations with MIT, which is the home of Julia. Uh, and this has come up a number of times. Right now we don't have, a, we're not planning a port to Julia, but we we are considering somehow integrations uh, into different. Let's say that we are focusing on trying to make it fast. Uh, for example, um, expensive geometry operations. We try to make them hookable, so plugable, so that you can switch a slow or a relatively slow Python implementation for a very fast. Um, C++ implementation if you need. Now there's a project, um, there's, it's already open, I think. It, it was published recently. The um, Compass Seagull binding. Seagull is super fast for doing things like Booleans and all, all, all these things. Uh, so one, one possibility for optimization is right now that you use um, Rhino when you're inside Rhino. And, and then you do booleans based on the, on the Rhino SDK. And when you're outside, you use uh, Compass Seagull. And then you get the fast performance of Rhino inside Rhino, the fast performance of Seagull uh, outside. Uh, and all this happens transparently to you. You just need to have them installed. And then it, the, the tool will pick, pick the best implementation available. I guess the same thing happens with web sockets and how we connect to ROS. Um, when you are inside Rhino, for example, we use .NET to, to actually do the web sockets. And when you're outside, we use um, Twisted from Python. Great, sounds good. Sounds... Um, and you're sort of the, the, the first ones to do this or is there other um, groups working on this similar research. I'm more thinking of, is, is there actually a classical question, I guess, is there a standard coming for this, let's say, um, driving uh, two paths <laughs> and, and 
is this the standard let's say <laughs> I, I i guess you're maybe you're familiar with this um xkcd uh, i didn't want to bring it up but yes yeah <laughs> <laughs> we are very aware of that and we don't want to be the yes we need a new standard <laughs> let's reinvent the wheel um so we we try to be bridging the, between existing standards so that you can keep working with the tools that you work and you can still collaborate with other people that work with different tools so we, we're explicitly not aiming at becoming a new standard of anything uh, we're, we're just trying to bridge <laughs> worlds <laughs> right all right cool um any more questions from the audience perhaps or um don't see anything coming no nothing coming up yet um I think that's great. I think we'll we'll wrap it up here then uh, and move on to the next speaker. Thank okay. you very much. And Thank you. Yeah, looking forward to get my hands to it and <laughs> play a bit of myself. Thank you very much. Thank you.